Good morning, New City Church. What a day to be alive. What a day to be together in God's house. Matthew 28, 5 through 6. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Jesus is alive. Let's praise him this morning. If you guys would stand with us.
Apostles would have been left just saying to themselves, what have we been doing? And any person would have just gone back to living a normal life and saying, well, I don't know what that was, but let's go out to eat or something. But these guys... They saw the resurrected Christ. They spent time with him. They ate meals with him alive and they saw him die, but they saw him raise to life. So we have so much to celebrate today. Jesus is risen, he's alive. Amen. sin 
our Savior died, the Lord of life can't be contained. Our God has risen from the grave. Whoa, our God has risen from the grave. for the King of Kings, oh God, forever we will sing, we'll sing. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. victory is yours. You've already run. And we're forever grateful for the sacrifice, for what you bought us with. And it was all part of your plan, God. Jesus. 
Jesus, I can't really fathom how you gave your life up for me. I wonder what it felt like the night before you died. Teach me every day, lead me back to you. You don't leave me the same way that you found me, and I know you are faithful until the end. It's only by your precious blood, Lord, that we are clean. Wiping away the stain of sin and guilt. That's a gift that you give freely. I'm so thank you, thankful. 
And it's the only path, it's the only thing, it's the only way to you, God. And you say in your word that it's only but through me that you can see the Father. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious Thank you, Lord Jesus, that by your death, burial, 
and resurrection, God. We are saved if we believe and we follow you, God. Thank you, because our bodies are mortal right now, and they're breaking down. But our inner man is being renewed day by day, God. And we look forward to new resurrected bodies with you one day in your timing, God. Thank you for saving us, God. Our hearts go out to those that are far from you this morning. God, draw them in. Draw them close. God, help us to be a bold witness for you, Jesus, in the days ahead. Anoint Matt's message today, God, and let us hear from you, Lord Jesus, as we study your word. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. How is everybody? Does this work? All right. Well, good morning. Okay, Catherine did this to me but when she walked in. Okay, he is risen. Okay, some of you that grew up in a Baptist church get that. But, okay, if, if, you, if you didn't grow up in a Baptist church, you're supposed to respond and say, he is risen indeed. Okay, so I guess we can try again. All right, he is risen. He is risen. Okay. <laughs> I, every Sunday, every Resurrection Sunday my whole life growing up, that's what they did. Uh, when I, at the church I grew up in on Lawton. But anyway, I'm so thankful you're all here this morning. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this, on this most special day. And what a special day it is, a day of celebrating the life. Remember Jesus and John said, I am the resurrection. And the resurrection is not an event, it's a person. His name's Jesus. And praise God for that. So um, if you grab the notes out in the foyer, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a novel but it's, we have a, I'll go fast through them, I promise, so we'll, go, we'll make this quick, but uh, next weekend, next Sunday is the church picnic. We had to move it from last Sunday because of the weather, so join us next Sunday. Please, please come out and join us at Mitch Park at Pavilion Number 5. We're going to have a great time. We'll provide lunch. Just bring drinks and a lawn chair, and we're just going to hang out, let the kids go wild and, and work out all their energy so when they go home, you guys can relax and and it'll be a great time, great time of fellowship and just meet new people. I want to give an update real quick on the African, the boys' home. So we played this video last week uh, with Stephanie Brady, and all of you, all of you responded in, in droves for this. So they needed $58,000 to um, build a home or take over a house for 25 boys in Africa, in Uganda. And last week as a church, we gave them a check for 33000 which was to meet the goal. It was to finish the goal that they had. So it was awesome. Um, so they, they have everything they need to make that happen. And they're going over at the end of April to buy the home and get it, start the renovations. And so 25 boys in Uganda will have a home uh, that celebrates Jesus, thanks to all of you in here and your prayers and joining us in, in supporting them. Uh, please continue to pray for them. As, as I mentioned last Sunday, Africa is a very charged, spiritually charged continent. Uh, there's a lot of attack on Christians over there. So please, please keep lifting them up in prayer and protection and just pray for their salvation for those boys that they, that they have an intimate relationship with Jesus out of this. So just great news, great news on this day for those, those young men. Okay, I don't really have anything else. So let's pray, grab some coffee and donuts, say hi to someone, the kids. Uh, second grade and below, we'll go down the sidewalk here, third and fifth grade out here, and we'll get started here shortly. Lord, I just thank you so much for this time together. God, I thank you for your word that is inexhaustible. I thank you, Jesus, that you are the resurrection and the life and the length of our days. And God, I pray that you would speak to us, give us ears to hear exactly what the Spirit is saying to the churches this day. And I thank you, Lord, that this day we get to celebrate you all over the world it's you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's not about any other man. It's not about any other platform, any other church, nothing. It's just about you, Jesus. And we lift you up and we exalt you above all. And we thank you for this time together. Please be with the kids. They learn about Passover and what this week meant for all of us and what you fulfilled in detail. Thank you, Jesus. Be with us. Be with us, God. 
and speak to us this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, grab some coffee and we'll get going here in just a few minutes.
No other king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for, the one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic Law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule, to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Let's open up in prayer, and what a special day this is. This is awesome. Just a great, great Sunday. Lord, I thank you so much for this time together. God, I pray that you would be with us. Lord, I thank you for the resurrection to new life. And Lord, as we study what you accomplished, set before the foundation of the earth, During the week of Passover, Jesus, we are just so thankful that you did it on our behalf and on behalf of everyone to ever live to give them hope and life eternal. And Jesus, thank you that you are the resurrection and the life. And Lord, it's because of that, because of the resurrection, Jesus, your sacrifice was accepted. And it's only because of that that our faith is worth anything And that because of that, we too will be raised up to new life. Speak to us this this morning, Lord, as we study your word and as we give you glory for what you did during the Passover, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. So what an amazing time. You know, this in the Western world, we're celebrating what the church calls Easter today. And biblically, it's called the Passover. And that's what, that's what God would have us celebrate is the Passover. And it's the week, that week really was the fulcrum of all history. Of all, all of the earth, all history of the earth was judged on that one week. And he turned, Jesus turned everything upside down for us. And it's the, it is the central point of humanity. So before it was nothing but death. After it is nothing but life and the resurrection. And it's a moment where really when time and eternity collided because time stood still. Jesus was resurrected in that tomb. Every ray of light probably was piercing that rock when that body was levitated off the table. And in just in a moment, he came back to life in a new body. Just amazing. Every sin, past, present, and future was paid for that, at that moment and just buried in the depth of hell where he took it. You know, on the cross, he said to telestai, and in Hebrew it means it is finished. It is finished. And according to God's law, the sin debt could be paid in full by a substitute. So praise God, you and I did not have to pay for our own sin. 
And unfortunately, people that do not accept Jesus, that's what they end up doing for all eternity is trying to pay for their sin in hell. And unfortunately, it can never be accomplished, which is why it is eternal. And so if you don't appropriate the blood of Jesus to your life and allow that your debt is paid in full by him, then you have to spend an eternity trying to pay for it yourself. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. But one sinless man for all sinless men. And it's just amazing. Isaiah 53 is all about the substitute, how Jesus was our substitute. Now, we were talking, actually, my family and I were talking about this on the drive over. We were talking about Passover. And Passover this year falls on the Jewish calendar. It falls on our calendar, April 22nd to April 30th. It's actually a seven-day feast in the Bible, and God instituted it, and that's what he wants us to celebrate is Passover. That's the biblical celebration that Jesus fulfilled. And you might ask, well, why are we celebrating? What's Easter about and the whole thing? Why is it on March 31st if it's a month before Passover, and how does that work? You know, why is it different every, every year? Well, it's pretty simple, really. It's Daniel 7, 25, speaking of the Antichrist. But he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Okay, Satan's goal throughout the Bible is to change times and law. He tries to, to operate and move time around. And what happened, not to get off on too much of a rabbit trail, but what happened was the Council of Nicaea in early, early church days, they deliberately created a formula where Easter would never fall on the Jewish holiday of Passover. And so it just inserted a lot of confusion into the church for thousands of years. And the church is very confused globally on, well, are we celebrating Easter or is it Passover? You know, what's going on? But that's the history behind it. If you want to dig into that, the early church of the Council of Nicaea moved those dates around so that Easter would never fall on Passover. But we're going to talk about Passover and what is it about biblically. And last week, if you were here, we went through a deep study of Jesus in the Old Testament. And after Jesus was resurrected at the end of Passover, he goes on a seven-mile Bible study with these guys on Luke 24, verses 13 through 15. And behold, two of them went that same day to the village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. That's about seven miles and they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So Jesus is walking with these guys. And beginning at Moses, so he skipped down to verse 27. Beginning of Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And I think that is fascinating. That last week, the Lord had us go through Jesus in the Old Testament and here he is, right after he's resurrected, he goes on a seven-mile Bible study with these guys and gives them that lesson of where he showed up throughout the Bible in the Old Testament, starting at Moses, the very beginning. So what Jesus had just fulfilled when he did this was laid out in great detail throughout God's word, the Passover. Now, a lot of these verses in your notes, I'm not going to read them all verbatim, but they're there for you to go home and study on your own. But after the church is raptured and we're in the throne room of the universe, there's only one that's worthy to take back dominion of the earth. See, Adam, Adam lost dominion of the earth. He gave it to Satan when he fell. He and Eve fell. Because it was given to a man, a man lost it, a man had to regain it. What's one of many reasons why Jesus had to become a man. And he is the only one worthy to take that dominion back. And when you get to Revelation 5, we are up there in the throne room of the universe looking for a man to come and take back dominion of the earth. Look what it says here, starting in verse one. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man, so notice, we're up there. We look in three spots, in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Now, why would we look in three spots? That's a, that's a challenging thing to think about. It's because at this moment, there are men in all three of those spots when we're in the throne room of the universe. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open, to read, to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. So this, this 
indictment, the sealed indictment that the father is holding to take back the earth, what was rightfully lost, you're not even, you and I are not even worthy to look at it. It's that important. It takes that much holiness and righteousness. And be held and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood, look, this is a Passover term. This is Jesus, a lamb as it had been slain. So that's Jesus. So because he was slain for us, he alone is worthy to come and take that back, take dominion back. Okay, so he's, his death has much more to do than just giving us eternal life. It even has to do with creation and taking back earth itself as dominion. So he comes forward, he takes the scroll, and he begins to loose the seals thereof. And, be, and I beheld, if you skip down to verse 11 here, and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them with 10,000 times 10,000 in the Greek, that's actually an innumerable number, number of, of angels. And thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive seven items, power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. So that's, that's our Jesus. He's going to receive all of that. And he's, he receives all of it when he takes back the scroll and he sets up the millennial kingdom on the earth. Okay, now if you go to Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now we talked about this a lot last week, how Jesus came not to destroy the word of God, but to fulfill every single detail in it. And that's why in Psalms 40, verse seven, he says, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Jesus is the entirety of God's word. Remember John 1, 14, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Okay, so Jesus is the word. So he fulfilled everything. So the Passover is instituted in the, in the Exodus event in Exodus 12, and the Passover is what Jesus fulfilled literally that week in the Gospels that we study. And the Passover, when God institutes it, he gives them a new calendar. And so the Jews, it's a new, it's a new way of life for them, something they had never done before. And what I want you to notice, too, is that the Passover is instituted, it's instituted before the law is given. Now, that, that could make your head spin a little bit. But it's instituted before Mount Sinai, before the law of Moses, before the, the deliverance out of Egypt. It's actually instituted while they are in bondage in Egypt. It's a way out. It's a way out to live for him. And it's to be covered by the lamb, the blood of the lamb. So look what happens. Every man take, took a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. The Passover is actually the, the only feast that's to be instituted by the man of the house. So just to give you a hint of how important being a father, a husband is to God, you are the one to institute this feast and to make sure your family is covered by the blood of the lamb. So you have that issue. Look at Exodus 12, four, starting verse four. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. That's an important detail. Without blemish. So they inspected the lamb on the 10th day of Nisan. That's the day Jesus rode in on the donkey, the 10th of Nisan, where the lamb was to be inspected and they couldn't find a blemish on him. A male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. So the 14th day is when you had to slaughter the lamb. That's when Jesus was crucified, the 14th day. So he rides in on the donkey on the 10th, the 14th he's crucified, the 17th he's resurrected, just to give you a feel for the week we're, we're gonna study here. Okay, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Now, Jewish tradition has that when they put this blood on the two doorposts and the lintel, that when the blood would run down, it actually formed the shape of a cross is how they would, they would view that in Jewish tradition. 
but the lambs to be without blemish and once killed, you just appropriated to your household. Now notice, it didn't matter if you were Jew or Gentile, if you were covered by the blood, then you were saved. You had to partake of it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roasted with fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, and they shall eat it, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the the pertinence thereof, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. So you had to consume all of it, not just a piece of it. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire, and thus shall ye eat of it, with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So you are to partake of the Passover, appropriate the blood with your loins girded. That means ready to go. So loins girded is like your your robe on, your belt around, your shoes on, you are ready to move at that moment. That's what they had to do. And a staff in your hand. The loins girded, that's, it's really an ancient phrase that means tucking up the traditional long robe. If you've all seen the movies where they wear these, these long robes, what they would do is kind of tie it in a knot and tuck it in their, their ro- the rope around their waist. So it would not hamper you physically, so you wouldn't trip. And the lesson there for us, the object lesson, is that what covers you should not hinder you. And so if you're covered by Christ, it will not hinder you in your walk once you're ready to go. And once you're covered by the blood, you were to be ready for action. You had to move. You had to get going. Okay, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Now, this is curious. You know, why would God have to kill all the firstborn animals and what technology did, did the destroying angel use to know which animals were the firstborn? It's pretty amazing when you really think about it. it in Nineveh, actually I was reading this this week in my daily reading. I had never noticed this before, but the king in Nineveh, when Jonah went through, had not only everyone from him down to the least of them repent and put on sackcloth and ashes, but he had the animals, the animals could not be fed and they were dressed in sackcloth. Like he had the animals do it. I always thought that was very curious. I don't know if it goes back to maybe this legend in Egypt, but it's just one of those things that I, it popped out at me. I was like, wow, I've never noticed that. So anyway, I am the Lord and the blood shall be to, to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now this is towards the very end of those, all those plagues. Remember, toward the very end. Now, one of the things that you need to recognize in the year that we're living in right now in 2024 is that there's a lot going on in the world. And the Lord told me on March the 8th that we are living in the land of Goshen. So if you don't know what that means, Goshen is the place in Egypt where the Israelites were protected during all of that judgment. They had light, they had abundance, their cattle wasn't destroyed, their crops weren't destroyed. They were separated out from the Egyptians from the Gentile world. And so they're there in Goshen during this time, instituting the Passover. And the only saving option was the blood. There's no other option. There's no other way around it. Jesus is the only way. And the blood of the lamb is the only way to the father and to heaven for eternity. And that's the same for us today. So after appropriating the blood, they had to be ready for war. When we get to the gospels, there are many times people try to take Jesus to make him king. He shows up, they try to take him, but he always slips away, right? And he says a couple times, John 6, for example, mine hour has not yet come. See, he, had to, he knew he had to fulfill the Passover week and it wasn't time yet. But in one evening, Jesus not only allows it, he arranged it. Remember, he tells them to go get a donkey. And his descent on the donkey was to begin the fulfillment of the Passover feast. Now, it's interesting too that that donkey could never, it never was set on. So it was not a trained animal. And if you've ever seen someone try to get on a horse or a donkey that's not trained, they go crazy. Yet somehow Jesus gets on a donkey that's never been ridden upon and it's calm, it's collected. He's in charge the whole way. Okay, from that very moment, creation stood still at him and he's in charge the entire week. When you study that week in detail throughout the gospels, he arranges everything. And we're gonna look at a few of those examples, but 
Look at John 1, 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. See, that's a Passover phrase. That's John saying, here is our Passover Lamb, the Lamb of God. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 God tells us as the church, purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. Remember, leaven always represents sin in the Bible. Leaven represents sin because it puffs up. Okay, leaven, you put it in the bread, it would make it rise. And that's what sin does to a lot of people. It puffs them up. It gives them a sense of arrogancy, of pride that sets in. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So again, there's that Passover link. So when Jesus rides in on the donkey, he fulfills a lot of prophecies starting from that moment. Zechariah 9.9 is prophesied where he would ride in on that donkey, and he fulfilled it, literally. Matthew 21 is when he gives them the directions to go get the, the donkey and bring it to them. Remember, he even tells them, if someone says, what are you doing with this? Tell them the master has need of it. It's interesting, he says master there. That's in Matthew 21, one through five. But as Jesus rides in on the donkey, the people are singing something and they, they miss it a little bit because they're singing Psalms 118, 26. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. They're supposed to be singing that in the millennium. They kind of missed the fact that he had to die first. But that's what that song is for, is when he's in the millennial reign of Christ, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So he's so precise. God is so precise in everything, everything he does. He is the ultimate mathematician. I mean, honestly, he is, it is mind-numbing how, how mathematically in tune the Bible is to everything God does. But the timing of him riding on the donkey, if you've never studied this before, it's to the day from Daniel 9. And we're not going to go into a lot of detail, and I just want to give you the slide that shows you on slide 14 there. Daniel 9 prophesies the 70 weeks of Daniel, is what it's called, 70 weeks for God's people. Well, what he says is that from the decree to go forth and rebuild the wall in Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, would be 69 weeks of years on the Jewish calendar. So 69 weeks would be 69 groupings of seven-year periods. Now, everything God does on his calendar is 360 days, whereas we're 365 and a quarter days today. But when you do the math, it's 173,880 days. And sure enough, from the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus, it was on March 14th of 445 BC is when he told Nehemiah to go rebuild the wall in Nehemiah chapter two. That decree from that day to Jesus riding on the donkey was exactly 173,880 days when the lamb was inspected, fulfilling that prophecy in in the 10th of Nisan. And there's all the math when you adjust for leap years and all of that. So he's riding in deliberately at that time. And then the Passover week happens. He fulfilled so many prophecies the Passover week that he'd make a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Zechariah 9.9, we just looked at that in Daniel 9. People sing Hosanna to him in Psalms 118. He's betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. We studied that back in Zechariah 11, verses 12 through 13. And remember in that prophecy in Zechariah, it's not only that he would be betrayed for silver, but the amount of silver and what they would do with the money and who would receive it. And he's betrayed for 30 pieces. They give it to the potter to buy a field. And that's exactly what they do in the gospels in Matthew 26. He'd be rejected in Psalms 118, 22 and 69. He did not speak in defense. There's one time in the gospels during the trials that he opens his mouth and it's because he was legally obliged to when the high priest put him under oath. And that's the only reason he opened his mouth. Otherwise he didn't. He'd be a smitten shepherd in Zechariah 13, seven. He'd be given vinegar and gall in Psalm 69. They would cast lots for his garments in Psalms 22. He'd be pierced in Zechariah 12, 10. Remember when he comes back the second time at the end of the tribulation, He declares, they, Israel, they will look upon me whom they have pierced. That's in Zechariah 12 and Psalms 22, 16. He'd be reproached and mocked in Psalms 22 and Psalms 89. He'd be whipped, not a bone would be broken. Remember the Roman soldiers came to him and they didn't break his bones even though they were directed to. They did the other two on the cross, but not his because he gave up the ghost. 
See, man can't kill God. He gave himself up. That's the, you have to keep that in mind too. And that was a fulfillment of the Passover from Exodus. Not a bone was to be broken. And that's in Psalms 34, 34 verse 20. Even his beard would be ripped off in Isaiah 50 verse 6. And you don't see that in the Gospels, but in Isaiah 60, they, he gave his back to the smiters and they ripped off his beard. They plucked his beard. So they ripped it off and probably he had a ton of scar tissue from that. He was beaten so badly in the Hebrew in Isaiah that he wasn't even recognizable as a man, as a son of man. That's how badly he was beaten. When you go to Psalms 22, it's, it's really, it's Jesus' first person singular from the cross. It even opens up with, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the whole thing is Jesus. And you learn a lot about the cross from Psalms 22 that you don't see in the gospels. But one of the interesting tidbits in it is verse six, where Jesus pronounces, but I am, that's one of my favorite titles of Christ from John. Remember, I am. The whole gospel of John's structured around these I am statements from Jesus. I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Now in the Hebrew, what that is, you think, why is Jesus saying I'm a worm? That makes no sense at all. Why would he on the cross say he's a worm? Well, what he's saying, it's in the Hebrew, it's worm, it's tola, means worm, crimson, and scarlet. So there's one particular type of worm in Israel that was used to make scarlet dye. And this scarlet dye is made from the dried body of the female worm. And what she would do is climb up on the tree and pierce the, the thin bark of these twigs, and she'd use the sap to prepare this waxy scale around the worm. And they still do this today in Israel. And the scale would protect its body, and the red dye is in the scale. So after piercing, the red dye was made, just like Jesus on the cross. After he was pierced, the blood flowed then. And the crimson spot, so she would give up her body, the crimson spot is left on the branch, and the scarlet spot dries out in three days and it's changed to white and it flakes away. It's amazing. The whole thing just lines up with what Jesus did for us on the cross in creation itself. And that's why in Isaiah 118, he says, your, your sins shall be as scarlet, but they shall be as white as wool. Okay, the Passover week, when you look at it on the Jewish calendar, the 10th of Nisan to the 17th. Okay, the lambs inspected on the donkey. We talked about that. The fig tree was cursed on Sunday. That's the 11th of Nisan. The 12th, the conspirators, the conspirators counseled together on Monday. The 13th is the Last Supper on Tuesday. The 14th is when the crucifixion happened, the Passover lamb for us. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was on Thursday. The women prepare the spices, etc., on Friday for the body. And the resurrection actually happens on Saturday, but the empty tomb is discovered Sunday morning. That's why in all of our songs and everything, you know, Sunday's coming, get ready, Sunday's coming. And the women find the tomb Sunday morning. And that morning, the 17th of Nisan on Saturday night, when Jesus was resurrected and he leaves the tomb, even it, the final day was predictive because of Genesis 8.4. And in Genesis 8.4, the Holy Spirit tells us what, when the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. The ark rested on the seventh, seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, why would the Holy Spirit want you to know that? It's because Noah's new beginning on planet earth, walking out of that ark was on the anniversary in advance of our new beginning in Christ when he was resurrected. All the way from the beginning, it was planned in that one event even in Genesis. And if you track down the 17th of Nisan throughout the Bible, a lot of days of deliverance occur on that one day. It's pretty fascinating. But the final week in the Gospels, when you look at it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when you're going through the Gospels, you're reading around these different events and it's in different chapters lined up in different parts of the Bible. And you kind of can get lost in it at times in terms of how do you put this together? So I'm hoping when you go home and study, this little table will help you. But the triumphal entry is in Matthew 21 through 23, Mark 11 and 12, Luke 19 and 20, and John 12. The end time discourse, or what we might call the Olivet Discourse, happens after that in Matthew 24, 25, and Mark 13. Those are the same discourse. Luke 21 is a different one. It's a different place, a different time. It's a different discourse. It's for the church. For the Jews, it's Matthew 24 and 25. 
to survive the tribulation. The last Seder is Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 13 through 18. So you kind of see how it works down through the week. The crucifixion is Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. And then the resurrection is Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20 through 21. So you can kind of see that. Jesus was in charge the entire time, like I mentioned. And everything was controlled by him, by Jesus Christ himself. Remember in Matthew 26, he puts Judas on the spot. You know, he says, one of you will betray me. And they all start coming to him. Well, is it me? Is it you? Is it, who is it? And he says, the one who dips the sop with me, he's the one that will betray me. He calls Judas out at the dinner. And so Judas has a very short window to act at that moment. From that time, he had to make arrangements with the high priest gather the troops, schedule a morning appointment with Pilate, etc. And even in Gethsemane in the garden, remember it's Jesus who was giving the orders. So they all come at him with swords and torches and troops and the Roman military and whatever, they come to him. And this is one of my favorite events in, during that week in John 18, verses four through six. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as then, as he had said unto them, I am, again, one of my favorite titles of Jesus, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Now, by the voice of God himself, he could have left them there for all eternity. And they could have just been hanging out, still on their knees, still over in Israel, wondering how they're going to arrest this guy. But he lets them up because remember by Colossians 1.16 that by him all things consist or are held together. He controls the very atoms within our bodies and with all of creation. And he, he's controlling the whole narrative here. When they arrest him, he goes through six illegal trials full of fraud. Absolutely full of fraud. There were three Jewish trials and three Roman trials. The Jewish trials are with Annas in John 18 12 through 14, with Caiaphas in Matthew 26, 57 through 68, before the Sanhedrin in Matthew 27, 1 through 2. And then he's got these Roman trials with Pilate in John 18, with Herod in Luke 23, and with Pilate again in John 18. Remember, remember poor Pilate, he wants nothing to do with this guy. And he keeps sending him back and forth to the Jews. And I find no fault with this man. They even washes his hands before them. Remember when, they, when he is crucified and they go and bury his body. You can even hear the cynicism, cynicism in his voice when he tells them, go seal up the tomb as much as you can. Put your best watch before. You can hear him just telling them, hey, I know this was the son of God. Remember his wife has the dream and she tells him have nothing to do with this man. Pilate did not want to have to go through with that, but of course he does. Okay, in John 18 verse 14 just to give you one little clue here. Now Caiaphas, which was, was he, which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. See, there is a prophecy that one man would die for everyone. And Caiaphas was trying to counsel them that one man should die for everyone. And that's, of course, when they wanted to switch with Barabbas. Remember, they want Barabbas set free, not Jesus. And they thought that they were setting him free for all the people when really one man needed to die for all the people and they just didn't get it. So self-incrimination was prohibited in their law and yet that is all they brought against Jesus was self-incrimination. Every aspect of the six trials, the six being the number of man, were illegally administered. The religious trials ended and the Jews wanted Jesus to go before the civil authorities for criminal prosecution. So the Jews had lost the ability to administer capital punishment. So they had to get Jesus before the Romans to pull that off. Now, that was a prophecy fulfilled from Genesis 49, verse 10. That's why Jesus was crucified and not stoned. The Jews, their form of capital punishment was stoning. But Genesis 49, 10, this, remember when Jacob is prophesying over the, his 12 sons? And when he gets to Judah, he has a prophecy for them. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall be the gathering of the people be. Shiloh is a title, a Jewish title of the Messiah. 
So what he was saying in that prophecy is that the scepter, that's an ancient way of saying your ability to administer capital punishment will not depart from Judah, won't depart from Israel, nor a lawgiver between his feet until the Messiah come. So when Rome conquered Israel, the Jewish people that knew this prophecy, the Sanhedrin, the the Pharisees, all those people, they walked around the city in sackcloth and ashes mourning that they had lost the ability to administer capital punishment and there was no Messiah. They thought God's word had been broken. And yet up there in Nazareth, there was a young man that was born who was trained to be a carpenter that was their Messiah waiting for his time. But they missed it. They missed it. But that's why the Jews constantly send him back to the Romans to try to get him killed is because they, couldn't, they could not administer the death penalty, which is why he's crucified, like I mentioned, in a form that, was, that wasn't invented, but just a century before, but yet prophesied hundreds of years before in Zechariah. It's just amazing. Here's some illegal aspects of these trials. Now, if you're sensitive to what's going on in our nation today, you could say, wow, this sounds really familiar. Uh, the courts are, are kind of an abomination before the Lord right now. And there's so much going on in our land. We're going to pray for our country at the end of the message and talk about this. But look at these illegal aspects. The binding of a prisoner before he was condemned was unlawful unless resistance was offered or expected, which Jesus did not. He didn't offer any resistance. That's in John 18, 12 through 24. It was illegal for judges to participate in the arrest of the accused. And yet in the garden, there's the judge with them. John 18, verse three. No legal transaction, including a trial, could be conducted at night. And yet at night's when they started in John 18, verse 28. The arrest was effected through the agency of an informer and a traitor, Judas. And that was illegal. John 18, five. And you can go back to the law in Exodus 23 where that was illegal. While an acquittal could be pronounced the same day, any other verdict required a majority of two and had to come on a subsequent day, and it did not. And they, they offered the verdict of guilty. In Matthew 26, verses 65 through 66, the high priest rent his robe, and that was illegal according to Leviticus 21, verse 10. He couldn't tear his robe. And you know he's wearing his robe, even though it doesn't say that, he had to be because the high priest put Jesus under oath. So he had to be wearing his high priestly robe to do that. And he rented, he tore it apart and he couldn't have. No prisoner could be convicted on his own evidence. In Matthew 26, 63 through 65, that's all they do. It was the duty of a judge to see that the interest of the accused was fully protected. And they didn't in John 18, verse 14. Preliminary hearings of a magistrate were completely foreign to the Jewish legal system. And yet they did that in John 18. The judges sought false witnesses against Jesus. Remember the witnesses couldn't agree and, and they, couldn't, they did not have, as a result, two witnesses. So in a Jewish court, the accused was to be assumed innocent until proven guilty by two or more witnesses. And even in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 19, by two or more witnesses, a matter shall be established. And that's carried on into the New Testament. The Jews failed to find two witnesses agreeing on anything in, against Jesus. When the witnesses first disagreed, Jesus should have been released and set free, and he wasn't. They just, they were obsessed with getting this man and killing him. And of course, it was to fulfill all this prophecy for us. But the trial under Caiaphas took place in his own home rather than in the council chamber where it should have been held. And in John 18, verses 13 through 16, you see that they went to the palace of the high priest. So not in the, in the temple, they went to his personal home. The court lacked the civil authority to condemn a man to death. Remember, it was taken from them. The Romans were the only ones that could do that, and yet they did it in John 18, verse 31. It was illegal to conduct a session of the court on a feast day, and yet they did. Do you, are you getting the idea of how they just, they didn't care what, what they did wrong outside the law. All they wanted was kill Jesus, kill Jesus, kill Jesus. A guilty verdict was rendered without evidence, the balloting was illegal. That sounds a little familiar. It should have been by roll with the younger voting first. In Matthew 26, they didn't do that. The sentence is finally passed in the palace of the high priest, but the law demanded it be pronounced in the temple, in the hall of hewn stone, and they didn't do that in John 18. 
Now, Proverbs 11, verse 1 says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. And every balance they used was a false balance throughout the entire, the entire court system, the three Jewish and three Roman. And every false balance possible was brought out against Jesus. You know, Pilate even knew that Jesus is king. In John 19, verse 19, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was in all capital letters, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh unto the city or to the north of the city. And that's what we looked at last week. It's the same place where Abraham offered Isaac at the top of Mount Moriah, north out of Jerusalem. It was 777 meters above sea level is where Abraham offered Isaac, but there was a substitute for him. And then that's the very place that a father did give his son thousands of years later on our behalf. It was all foretold all the way back in Genesis that that would happen north of the city on a place that we call today Golgotha. And there's a, there's a skull in the side of the mountain. That's where it gets that, the place of the skull. Okay, it's written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Now that's pretty amazing that Pilate could write in three languages. He was a, a pretty brilliant man. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of, I am the, king of the Jews. Now, anytime in the, in the gospels that the Jewish people come and they're all bent out of shape about something with Jesus or the authorities, just know that's a place that God is telling you, dig here. There's something in the Old Testament that you're missing that they're upset about. Every single time, it never fails. And look what Pilate answered. What I have written, I have written. And in the Greek, actually, what it says is, what I have written will always be written. It will never go away that he is the king of the Jews. Now, Pilate, this is the very bottom of the slide. This is what Pilate wrote. And it goes, Hebrew, remember, goes right to left. And what he wrote was an acrostic. This is why the Jews are all bent out of shape. So Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, it's those four words in Hebrew, and it goes Y-H-W-H are the first letter in the acrostic of each word. And so he wrote Yahweh in their language, the king of the Jews. And that's why they're all upset. See, the Jews love all of these acrostics and these riddles and things that are hidden within the word of God, and they're true, and they love it. They search those things out, as we should from Proverbs 25.2. You know, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. The honor of kings is to search out a matter. But that's why they're upset. He, Pilate was messing with them. He knew what he wrote. And he wrote Yahweh on the cross. Pretty amazing. So Pilate knew. I will not be surprised to see Pilate in heaven, personally. I think he's probably, he probably got saved, is my guess. But at the Passover, there are four cups of wine. And the four cups are taken from Exodus 6, verses 6 through 7. This is where the Jews get this. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgment. And then in verse seven, I will take you to me for a people. So they view this as four promises by God at Passover. And I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the the burden of the Egyptians. So these four cups, the cup of sanctification, God bringing out from under bondage, the cup of thanksgiving, God did what he promised, the cup of redemption, God redeemed them with an outstretched arm, the cup of completion, God will take Israel for himself as a people. Now, when you get to the gospels, remember Jesus is doing the Passover and he stops at that fourth cup because that's not fulfilled yet. The first three he fulfilled, the cup of sanctification, thanksgiving, and redemption. But he's not taken them as a people for himself yet. That happens in the millennium. That's why he stopped at that cup. In Matthew 26, verse 29, he says, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it with you. Where? In my Father's kingdom. Now, you and I, get to participate with Jesus in drinking that cup in the millennium. And that's amazing. 
So when he takes Israel as a people for himself in the millennium, when we come back with Jesus in Revelation 19, we get to sit down with him and drink that cup, the cup of completion. Because at that point, he will usher in the millennial reign of Christ, the promise that was set to David in 2 Samuel 7 and fulfilled all over the Old Testament. And he will set up the kingdom that you and I get to participate in and the Jews will be a people finally under Christ's authority. Now, it's interesting that these four Passover cups are even modeled in the gospel of John. And four is also the number of the kingdom, the completion of material creation being put in order. So everywhere you see four, uh, God has order in it. You know, there's four sides to a building. Anyway, four, four different sets of wisdom teeth. There's all kinds of fours out there, wisdom. John 2, Jesus turns water into wine. That's the cup of sanctification. John 5, the man with infirmities for 38 years, which is interesting. The same number of years that the children of Israel stayed in the wilderness in one place, one generation, 38 years to dip in the pool. That's the cup of thanksgiving. John 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000 with bread. Okay, that's in John 6, verse 48. I am that bread of life. Jesus is acting out the third cup, the cup of redemption in that one. The Jews, however, are saying at this point that they will not eat of it, thus refusing fellowship with Christ. And then John 13, verse 17, those five chapters in John 13 through 17 represent the fourth cup, the cup of completion. It begins when Jesus washes the disciples' feet in John, at John 14, where Jesus declares that he will come and take us home. Remember, I go to prepare a place for you. In John 15, where Jesus is the vine, look at John 18, verse 11. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into thy sheath, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink of it? Remember Peter, poor Peter, you could do a whole study on where Peter messed up. He slept in the garden. He was supposed to be awake. He denied Jesus. You know, Peter should have been praying, not sleeping during that time. And you could get into a very deep study to learn a lot about your walk with Christ and what Peter did. You know, but without the resurrection of our, our faith, frankly, has no eternal meaning. There's nothing to it. It proves that Jesus is God's son and his sacrifice was fully accepted in John 10, verses 17 and 18. Look at John 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. That's, that's the promise for you and I. Jesus fulfilled the feast of first fruits also at the resurrection. It's because he was resurrected that you and I have that promise. Otherwise, you would die and never be resurrected. But because he conquered death, hell, and the grave, his sacrifice was accepted. Our sin paid in full. He was brought out of that tomb in new life. And you and I have that same promise the only dying you're ever going to do is when you died to self and accepted Christ. You'll never die again. You'll pass on from this breath to the next breath with him. That's it. That's not even death. That's just a transition period. But verifies the truth of God's word in Psalm 16 and 110 that God, that Jesus, his sacrifice was accepted. It assures his, resur his resurrection, assures our future resurrection, 1 Thessalonians 4 that's where we get our resurrected body is at the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Proof of future judgment in Acts 17, verse 31. That's a very interesting one. It's the basis for Christ's heavenly priesthood that we studied in Hebrews 7. It gives power for Christian living in Romans 6, verse 4. Because he's resurrected, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. It assures our future inheritance in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Look at this. Blessed be the God of our Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now that's amazing that because he was resurrected, you and I have an inheritance. It assures our inheritance in heaven. Remember what Jesus said, store up your treasure in heaven where neither moth nor thief nor rust can destroy. That's your eternal place. Your internal inheritance is on the other side of this. 
Don't worry about building up something in this world. It's just going to go away. It's going to melt away with fire. (laughs) And it will not, I tell people all the time, you will not be trading in dollars in the millennium. Okay, I promise. The dollars you're saving now will do you no good in the millennium. Uh, Maybe we'll have a burn party. I don't know. It'll be fun. Come back in the United States, dig up all the dollars there, buried everywhere, and just go have a big burn party. In Matthew 16, we're going to close with this, verses 9 through 20. The resurrection. What I want to talk about real quick are the mathematical improbabilities of these verses because the resurrection is supernatural. Starting in verse 9. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. Now, Mary Magdalene, just side note, that's not Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's a different Mary. And they went and they, when they had heard that that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them. And as they walked, he went into the country. Those are the guys he did the Bible study with. And they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat in, sat at me and, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. That probably had to be crushing to Jesus that they didn't believe yet he was risen from the dead. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now that's interesting. Every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believed, that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. See, Jesus right now is at the right hand of the Father. He's not on his throne yet. His throne is the throne of David that the angel Gabriel promised Mary when she was pregnant. Remember, your son shall sit on the throne of David. That hasn't happened yet. That's what happens in the millennium. There's more to be fulfilled in the Bible than has been fulfilled yet when you really dig into it. And they went forth and preached Everywhere, the Lord working with them and, com- and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now, what you just read, what we just read together, has a lot of supernatural characteristics embedded in the text. So we're going to close with this. The entire Bible is structured around the number seven. The Jews call it the heptatic structure of, ger- of God's word. And frankly, it is inexhaustible. You could spend a life studying this. Now, in John 20, verse 7, just as a side note, the napkin that was about his head, not lined with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. What In that note in the resurrection in John 20, Jesus is saying the napkin is a Hebrew way in their culture when you would fold the napkin separately and lay it down. That was their way to saying when you were a guest in someone's house that you appreciated the meal and you will return again. So that's what he's showing them in John 20 because the napkin was by itself I'll be back. I enjoyed my time with you. That's what he's telling the Jewish people. Dr. Ivan Panin, he was born in Russia in December 12th of 1855. He was exiled at a very early age from Russia, and he immigrated to Germany and then to the U.S. He graduated from Harvard in 1882, and he discovered Christ here in the U.S., and he spent his life studying the heptatic structure of God's word. So he committed the next 50 years of his life writing over 43,000 pages by hand of detailing the sevens in the Bible. Now, he did all of this by hand. He didn't use computers. Just, I mean, just think about that for a minute. He passed away to be with the Lord on October 30th of 1942. So what we just read in Mark 16, 9 through 20 about the resurrection, this is what he discovered the sevens. The number of words in those verses are seven times 25, 175. The vocabulary used in those verses is is 98 different words, seven times seven times two. The letters, 553 different letters, that's seven times 79. There's 294 vowels, seven times 42. The consonants, there are 259 consonants, that's seven times 37. The total vocabulary is 98, as we mentioned. Found before Mark, meaning the words used before those passages in Mark is 84. That's seven times 12. Only in these 12 verses 
is 14 of those words used. That's seven times two. The vocabulary used in the Lord's address is 42. That's seven times six. The vocabulary not used in his address is 56, seven times eight. The number of words in the Lord's address, again, 56, seven times eight. Numbers of words in, in the rest of the passages are 119. That's seven times 17. The verses 9 through 11 contain 35 words. That's seven times five. 12 through 18, 105, seven times 15. Verses 12 through 14 even have subsets of sevens. Seven times five, seven times eight, and seven times five again. It's just amazing. The total is 106,663 if you add up the numerical value of the words used in those verses. That's seven times 14,809. I know someone did the math in their head out there. I know it. Verses 9 through 11 uses 17,213. That's, again, a multiple of seven. Verse 9, a multiple of seven. Verse 10, a multiple of seven. The first word of verse 10, 98, is seven times 14. The middle word of the verse 10 is 4,529. Again, a multiple of seven. The last word of verse 10, 791, a multiple of seven. Verse 11, a multiple of seven. Verses 20 through 20, 12 through 20. Again, a multiple of seven, 86,450. The number of words not used before in Mark is 14, seven times two. Found later in the New Testament, seven times one. The occurrences of those later in the New Testament is 35, seven times five. The numer numeric value of those later in the New Testament is 8,246. That's seven times 1,178. The verse 20 vocabulary is 14. Verse 20 found previously is seven. Verse 20 found only here in that, those passages in Mark. Again, it's seven. So to meet a single one of those conditions, you have a one in seven chance. To meet two of them, it's seven squared. That's one in 49. Three conditions would be seven cubed, seven times seven times seven. We just went through 34 different conditions designed in that text documenting the resurrection of our Lord. And he found over 70 different conditions. That's unbelievable. That's seven to the 34 power, and that's a gigantic number, <laughs> okay? It would be impossible. You could not make, meet all of those conditions today if you wrote those same passages with the greatest supercomputers on earth. You could never do it. It would take you millions of years to do that. And what, what do you do with all of that? Well, it's because the resurrection of Jesus is supernatural, and you and I are due for a supernatural upgrade, and if you're in Jesus, you are going to get that resurrected body at the rapture, at the last trump in 1 Corinthians 15. He, God even declares in verse 52, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That's your promise if you're in Jesus. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. That's why Paul didn't want to die before the rapture. He didn't want to be what he called naked, being in between his death and the rapture where he gets his resurrected body. And your resurrected body, it's going to be amazing. You know, if you look at the, the light spectrum, the rainbow, every color you see right now is a variance of a different shade of those seven colors combined. But the light spectrum actually goes on infinitely in both directions which means in your resurrected body, you're not only going to see new colors, you're gonna see trillions of them. It's not just a different shade of blue or green. It's you will have eyes to see every color God created. And right now you're contained in these three and a half dimensions in this corruptible body, but you are marching toward a time that you will put on incorruption and Christ will call us home. All of your senses will be different. You're going to be able to smell sounds. You're going to be able to see notes. You're going to be able to do all kinds of things that you couldn't do before. Remember, Jesus came in and out of rooms without going through a door. That's what's waiting for you. And if you don't know Jesus, what we're celebrating today, the resurrection and his promise for us, it's very simple. It's just Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So you can make sure that you will never be separated from him for all eternity. It's that simple. And if you're out there listening and you're, and you're stuck in a life of bondage, 
I'm telling you right now that Jesus wants to set you free. He does not leave you in your sin where you are in chains and bondage, no matter what the world would tell you and try to celebrate that bondage, he wants you out. And he has a more vibrant life for you than you could ever imagine. You just have to give him a chance. And he will set you free and you'll be free indeed. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this time together. God, I pray that right now you would speak to those all over the world that, Lord, if they are trapped and enchained in bondage, that Satan wants to keep them there. God, you are not the author of confusion. And Jesus, you are the resurrection and life. So God, for all of those people that are confused about their identity, they're seeking an identity. God, we pray that right now you would set them free and speak to them and let them find their identity in Christ, in you alone, Jesus, and that you would come in and transform their lives and Jesus resurrect them to new life, never to be in shackles again. And Lord, we lift up your people all over the world right now that God, thank you that we live in a place that we can gather without the threat of persecution, without the threat of endangerment. God, that we can openly study the word of God without the threat of leaving this place and hiding. And God, we know that that is not the case for most of your body in most of the world right now. So Jesus, we pray protection around them. We pray that you would lift them up and that you would guard them. Lord, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, they would know when to move, when to meet, when to share, when to pray, when to gather and where to gather and that, Lord, you would continue the work until you call us home. And God, we thank you that you went and you conquered death, hell, and the grave on our behalf, that we never have to experience it. So Jesus, thank you for that. Be with us as we, as we leave this place, Father. We love you and we thank you for all you're doing in our lives. Be with us right here next week as we gather together to study your word as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You all have a great Sunday.